Word of warning, we don't actually have to go through the slide deck. It's just something I happen to have from another thing. But um, I know we've got at least one person who's fairly self-described as a newbie with uh, amateur radio and SDR. Who, where's everybody at vis-a-vis -vis amateur radio, SDR? Uh, I know Sean and Adam uh, work at a company that um, uh, uses SDRs. Uh, okay, fair enough. And Nick is, um, is busily working on his Hack RF and his um, Blade RF. Uh, Daniel? Okay. Okay. And uh, the RTL SDR? Okay. Okay. So would you all like for me to go through the slides and talk about this, or would you all rather just bah? I think I want to go to SDR. Okay. Okay. So we'll give the AV guy a moment to come back. I, I may move through the slides a little faster than in the areas. Oh, is it? Yeah. Okay. Oh, most excellent. Okay. I thought it, okay. So yeah, let's get going then. So, um, so I am Aaron Poffenberger, and the reason I wanted to um, do an SDR BOF is it's been, even on supported platforms, getting SDR stuff working is a challenge. So I don't know if you all, any of you all use Mac OS, but even getting some of the SDR tools to work on Mac OS has been hard. Uh, talking to Nick, it sounds like the GNU radio um, port is a little wonky, and I know the OpenBSD port is wonky right now. Yeah, but it's. Well, what I found on Mac OS is yes, technically there is a GNU Radio and GQRX um, script for getting all the goodies installed, but it's it's one of these things where you have to hold your tongue just right, and you know you have to do it on a full moon in order to get it to really install properly. I got it to work, uh, so, so that's why I wanted to have the boff, just so that those of us who are in BSD. And try and use BSD as our uh, you know, our daily driver can you know, get in, uh, a little bit more involved in ham radio. So I asked everybody what their experience is with with ham radio and SDR. Uh, okay, big zero, uh, Rod. Cool. Okay. 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 Well, you actually hit on something that I am going to talk about a bit um, as, as I go through this this slide deck, is why you might want to get an amateur radio license. And um, most people, when I give them the um, this particular pitch, if they're technically oriented, actually. Uh, I've had people come up after and said, yeah, I've started studying for my license or I got my license uh, because there, there are some real interesting aspects. Whether you do SDR or stick with um, traditional uh, analog and digital modes, there are a lot of reasons to consider amateur radio. But again, um, part of the reason I wanted to do the BOF was let's see how it ties into um, the BSDs. So I, I'm mostly an open BSD person, so I've been working, um, so Stuart Henderson, who's one of uh, the folks who does a lot of porting on the OpenBSD project um, started a port of GNU Radio, and the last time I, um, well, originally it was working, and I tried compiling it this week, and I've had troubles with it. So I'd really love to see the BSDs get these tools um, available. Um, I'm going to do a couple of introductions. Uh, so we've got Nick up here in front. I mentioned earlier he's doing work on FreeBSD with SDR. He has a Blade RF, which is a really cool radio based on FPGA. And he also, um, he and I both have what's called the Hack RF. It's not, I don't think it's a, a real honest goodness FPGA under, uh, under the hood, but the nice thing about it is it's relatively inexpensive and uh, it gives you a lot of power. One of the things I like about the Hack RF, uh, maybe the Blade does the same thing, is I can watch 25 megahertz um, of uh, bandwidth simultaneously. Uh, with this. Now when you're, um, 
in the upper upper um, bands, that's not all that impressive. You know, when you're in the gigahertz, 25 megahertz is it's just a sliver. But when you're down, say, in the FM radio band, I can watch the entire FM radio band simultaneously. Um, yes, sir. So the hacker app, um, and these are just rough numbers. Can you see about 20? I think you said a little bit more megahertz of bandwidth. Yeah. And the nice thing about it, it can go from about 30 megahertz yes. to 6 gigahertz. Yeah, with without enough converter. Right. But sadly, it's limited between 300 and uh, 3 gigahertz without a uh, converter. Yeah, there is enough converter. 4.4. Okay. Right. So, uh, but there is enough converter available for it. And there are actually two models of that device. I think Nick said he has the, um, the one with the smaller FPGA. I don't remember. Um, uh, how many units it has, but the larger one. But just to give you an idea of pricing, that is what, about 400, the um, 420. The Hack RF is about 300 bucks, um, between three, 350. And the, the big, uh, the, the larger version of the Blade RF is about 650, and the up converter is another couple hundred. But even still, in terms of being able to get into SDR, uh, well, and then there's actually some devices. Um, Sean, can I, can I have one of your devices for just a second? So this is, um, these devices like this, this is uh, based on the RTL-SDR, correct? And um, these are uh, little USB devices. These run for about 16 bucks, and there's various models of these. Well, this one's particularly interesting. I'm gonna have Sean talk about it in just a little bit um, because it has some extra um, uh, features and usefulness that his company makes um, use of. Thanks, sir. Uh, so let's go through this, like I said, this was a presentation I actually did about six months ago for my local DEF CON group. I'll, I'll go through a, a little bit faster in areas where I don't think it's um, all that critical. Unfortunately, I don't think we're gonna have a demo today. And that's partly because I can't get, uh, this, uh, I'm working on the port and uh, Nick's working on his uh, code. So we'll just deal with it as we um, go. So these are some of the things that, um, uh, you know, an outline of the uh, presentation. A little bit about me, I'm, I'm a software developer uh, by day. I've um, done uh, electronics. I got my first amateur radio license in the late 70s. Uh, it was a, back, this was back in the day when you actually had to pass a, um, a uh, you had to be able to receive code at five words per minute and you know, transcribe it. I let that license expire, went for, oh, who knows, 20 odd years without doing any ham radio. I still had my radios and I could still receive with them, but I kind of let it sit on the back burner. And I was at DEF CON a couple years ago and every year at DEF CON they will have a, uh, a, an intense walkthrough of the, you know, the course and then you um, take the test and you get your license. So I got my um, uh, amateur license, I uh, got the technician and then I immediately got my general class license fairly quickly after that. Okay, so what is amateur radio? So it's, um, it, it's radio service operated by amateurs in, in a nutshell, and, and it's important to understand that. Um, the reason that's important is most of the radios that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, iPhones and whatnot, these are licensed. You don't have to be anybody special to have a cell phone, because the cell phone itself is licensed. Um, on the, uh, the converse though, an amateur, well, anybody who has a license from the FCC, now, I'll have to warn you all, I know we're in Canada. I, I'm sorry? It's, uh, it's called the... Industry Canada. Industry Canada. Yeah. I was going to say, I, I, I'm from the U.S. These slides were developed originally for a presentation in the U.S., so I, I'm going to be a little U.S.-centric. If I know the Canadian answer, I will do the best I can to offer it. But a lot of this stuff is going to be similar across the countries because the ITU is the governing body that, um, th through which the amateur radio services of the various countries work together. But one of the key things, uh, so going back to the licensing, so either a device is licensed or a person is licensed. Uh, and, and that's critical to understand. So as an amateur, I am licensed. So what does that mean? As long as I stay within the, uh, uh, the bands that I'm authorized for 
as long as I stay within the modes that I'm authorized for, and if, as long as I, you know, so basically if I stay within the rules, I can operate almost any device that I can buy or build, and that's, uh, so that's key. So one of the things I, I tell technical people, the reason you want to think about amateur radio, if you have an amateur license, it's effectively a license to experiment with radio waves. Again, as long as you stay in your sandbox, and it, but it's a very big sandbox. It's a huge sandbox. And so uh, we have, uh, I'll get to some of the modes and other things, but in a nutshell, uh, we can do uh, uh, analog, we can do digital, uh, we can do SDR, which is part of what we're going to talk about today. Um, so the amateur radio service is fairly old. It was established um, in the early part of the 1900s. Because, you know, as you know, Marconi uh, and, and, and others who are working on radio at the turn of the century, the last, last century, were, um, they were describing how to use these radio waves. And so people around the world said, oh, I can do that. I happen to have a... Uh, uh, back then, they were using an, uh, an arc to actually do the uh, the coding, but I can build this. And so immediately, um, you know, because radio is a limited resource, the governments of the world um, pulled together and said, okay, we need to manage this. The amateurs were given what was thought to be the crap bandwidth. Um, they soon found that they were wrong, that they actually gave us an immense amount of really great spectrum, and we have fought them every um, step of the way to keep as much of that as we can. Okay. Uh, it is regulated by international agreement. So even though I'm a ham operator in the U.S., I can't just come in into Canada and begin transmitting without. Well, there, as long as there are agreements in place, but you just have to be, you have to know what's what's going on. So um, there are reciprocal agreements, and you have to know these things. But I can receive. I can grab any radio. Anybody, licensed or unlicensed, can get a radio and just plug it in and work with it. Uh, there's three major regions. They're listed there. Um, Starts in the 1900s. Um, so why are we called hams? Originally, it's because uh, the ham radio operators, at least this is what's believed, is that they were kind of ham-fisted, uh, if you've ever seen a, um, uh, a key for sending Morse code. Uh, but, the, the, uh, but it was derogatory. However it originated, it was kind of derogatory. And so the uh, hams kind of adopted it as a badge of honor. Uh, some notable accomplishments. So you've got the ARRL, which is the, it's based in the US, but it's effectively one of the largest um, uh, radio associations in the world. And they do a lot of the lobbying. Uh, every year, uh, I think it's actually every three years when the ITU gets together to talk about amateur radio stuff, uh, we're represented and they try and, and either get us new bands or hold on to uh, existing bands or open new modes to us. And modes are very important. So uh, to give you an example of modes, uh, voice is a mode, uh, digital is a mode, and there's various um, kinds of digital. There's uh, PSK uh, 13, there's, um, uh, well, we'll get to them. Uh, fast scan, slow scan TV, um, uh, packet radio. Uh, some of the things that hams have done that has, been, has uh, actually uh, been pretty impressive is uh, working on uh, skip propagation, moon bouncing, uh, meteor scatter bouncing radio waves. If you hear ham radio operators talking about making a contact to Australia from the US, this is actually significant. When you think about the fact that we're on a sphere, <laughs> you know, it, it actually uh, means something. Uh, does everybody understand the dif difference between megahertz and wavelength? I, I think most people here are fairly technical. Um, OK, so what can we do? So we can, again, transmit in the various bands. Uh, we've got voice, image, text. Um, Morse code is still, one of, uh, is still a thriving uh, mode of operation. Because it doesn't require very much bandwidth. It's extremely small. Um, you've got the PSK, phase uh, shift keying. Um, and then, like I said, we can operate in other parts of the US. In the US, I have no idea what it looks like in Canada. Some countries only have one class of license. But in the US, we have three uh, classes of license. You've got technician, general, and amateur extra. So if you, up here as well is, uh, basic. basic. Okay. Uh, there's advanced, which allows you to build your own transmitter uh, and file an amplifier. And then there's a uh, code endorsement for your bands. Okay. That's a little different in the US. In the US, starting at technician, you can make radios as long as, again, you stay in your sandbox and play nicely. Um, to give you an idea of what it takes to get your technician license, 
35 questions out of a pool of 450. The 450 are published, they're known. All the answers are published, they're known. If you go to Hamig... Okay. So, um, Mm -hmm. um, have a network too on the for Canada. Okay. Yeah, but if you haven't seen Canada. So, uh, www.orec.org. All the way on the screen is Quebec. Oh. Author Alpha Romeo Charlie Bach. Thank you. So, o a r c dot n e t. So, in the U.S., thirty-five questions. Dot net. net. Uh, thirty-five questions. General, 35 questions. Amateur extra, 55 questions. Realistically, if you get to general, you can do almost everything that's interesting. Um, license is good for 10 years. That's nice. There are no annual renewals just every 10 years. You know, again, speaking for the US. There's a there. Oh, lovely. Oh, OK. Uh, and that is one interesting thing. Uh, <laughs> this is amateur radio. Uh, we, so we're not allowed to be anonymous. There is no anonymous uh, radio. We, have, we don't have a cr encryption. You may not encrypt. You can't do anything that obscures your transmissions. Now, if you happen to speak Navajo, and your you know, correspondent happens to speak Navajo, that's not obscuring uh, your transmission. But there, um, that's the one key thing, is it's, it's, it's IRC effectively in that regard. Did you have a thought, Rob? OK. So. Um, so what do you need? Well, first off, really technically nothing. You can participate all you want, but it's kind of, uh, but I will tell you, if you get your license, as quickly as you can, get something that transmits. Um, we hold that radio up again. There we go. Is that a Bofang by chance? No, it's a There's a Bofang. So Nick has a Bofang. That's a $35 radio on Amazon. It, yeah, but it's cheap. It's cheap, and, and I would really encourage you, if you get your license, get something with which you can transmit fairly early on, because then you can start talking to other hams. In most um, large cities, you'll find repeater networks. That thing probably has maybe a four-mile radius on it, but if there's enough repeaters, I live in Houston, and I have chatted with people in Japan and in uh, the UK using what we call an HT, a uh, uh, handy talkie. Um, now, of course, it gets more fun when you have the bigger rigs. One of the things I didn't mention is, so the, those little radios that, that Nick has, um, those can transmit, but I think they're both, what, a half watt to a one watt? Kind of boring. Um, you really want something with a little bit um, more power. Uh, so if you're going to do the long distance modes, if, and if you're not going to use repeaters, 100 watts is a good place to, to consider um, getting into. Uh, obviously, some other things you're going to need is uh, an antenna. Uh, Antenna tuners are nice. They're, they're not necessary, but they are nice. They make life a little bit easier. Computer, uh, you know, again, if you're, if you're going to do any of the digital modes, if you're going to do any SDR, uh, you really need a computer. There are some full SDR uh, desktop rigs that you can get where you punch everything in via uh, the keys, but it's so much more fun just to connect your computer. And one of the things hams have done almost since the very, uh, as soon as computers were generally available, have started connecting to their radio rigs via um, usually uh, serial ports. Now we have USB, but almost everything still accepts a serial connection of one kind or another. Okay, so what is a, a software-defined radio? Uh, it's just exactly like what you might Im imagine. So uh, re replace purpose-specific circuits with general purpose computing and then do all the algorithms and software. So uh, GNU, what makes GNU radio so powerful is someone has gone in and written a framework and written tons of little modules that do almost anything uh, that you can need. Uh, GNU radio itself is not meant to be uh, your radio control um, toolkit. It's a, an erector set for creating things. Nobody really likes to work with GNU radio directly. But there's something called GQRX, which is a really nice, uh, nicely put together package that gives you a uh, nice waterfall, um, nice ability to tune. So uh, on OpenBSD, that's what I'm actively working on is trying to get us um, GNU radio. Um, and GQRX. Uh, just a couple things on getting started. Uh, depending on where you live, uh, you know, again, this law this is very US centric. For the US po folks, hamexam.org is your friend. It will let you take test, 
after test after test until you, you've mastered the, um, uh, the test. And it grades you and lets you know how you're doing. So I would definitely, uh, one of the things you will need to know to get your techni technician's license, make sure you understand Ohm's law. I mean, that, that's probably, unless you're the kind of person who just wants to memorize all the answers. Uh, you can do that. There's only 450 questions, four, you know, four possibilities. Just memorize them all. I know people who have gotten their amateur extra when it comes to the, um, the phaser section who uh, have just memorized it. You do have to memorize the band plan for your country. Uh, there will be questions like, okay, if you're in the, the two-meter band, um, one, what does that mean? Um, you know, where can you do um, digital mode? Where can you do um, you know, CW and things like that? But it's not hard. Uh, I hadn't studied for 20 years. I'm staying there at DEF CON. I went through a quick re um, review of all 450 questions, stood in line, and just iterated over them until I took the test. And uh, pretty easy to get your technician license. Again, get, get yourself a good radio to get started with. Okay, so for, the, for SDR to get started, the RTL SDR is a great way to start. This is a little USB device. I've seen them as low as 10 bucks. I've seen them as much as 20 bucks. There's one over there. Uh, Sean Kelly has the one in the back. Sean Kelly has a, um, a bunch uh, with him. These things are really fantastic. Cheap, easy way to get started. And uh, at least in the OpenBSD ports tree, we have something called the RTL SDR. I've got to imagine it's been ported to FreeBSD as well. This will let you start playing with it. OK, I see a, a head nodding. FreeBSD has RTL SDR. OpenBSD has it. That's enough to get started. And um, I, I can't remember what the band range is on those. Does anybody remember on the RTL SDR what your um, range is? Okay, so about 30 uh, megahertz up to about one gigahertz. Is that right? Okay, roughly. That's a lot of, that's really a lot of bandwidth. Um, yes, sir? But the cool thing is, yes, in North Europe, in North Europe, it is a TV tuner. You're absolutely right about that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we're hearing about 1.2 megahertz is the bandwidth uh, on these things. But it is a good start. And, and again, because it's a receiver, you can get one as soon as you get home. Just uh, order one on, on Amazon. Um, and then if you want to spend a little more money, you got the Hack RF, the Blade RF, and the AirSpy. I don't think we have any AirSpies uh, here in the room. And there are, um, I don't think there's any Windows people here, but there are some um, .NET versions of, of this stuff. So just to, wow, I went through that fast. Okay, so but I'm glad I actually did go through this fast because what I want to do is let Sean talk a little bit about um, how uh, his company is using the RTL SDR. They're doing something really interesting uh, with it. And then I also have, uh, give Nick a few minutes to maybe talk. And if anybody else has anything on uh, SDR or, or you just want to, we can open it up and just kind of turn it into a, a, a chat session. So, um, Sean, you want to take a minute? Hello, I am Sean Kelly and I'm from FlightAware. Uh, we track planes, basically. We get data from the FAA and other data sources. And as part of the next-gen FAA effort and around the world, there is a deployment happening of ADSB, which stands for Autonomous, oh Autonomous Dependent Surveillance Broadcast. And so planes are starting to broadcast their altitude and their location and their position, or those are redundant. <clears throat> but what we did is in 2014, we put some, some links on the site to various parts, and we started providing an image that you could download 
and put on an SD card and put it on a Raspberry Pi. Uh, disclaimer, it runs Linux because we had issues with FreeBSD. So we were having issues where positions would not be consistently broadcast, like we'd get drops. So there's an issue there. Um, I'm actually on the operations team, so I don't know a lot about how it's done and what the software is doing. But in 2014, we started with about 100 users. And in 2016, we now have over 6,000. So what we've done is created a network of people who are running Raspberry Pis with RTL SDRs like this to help us collect data. And so the data gets sent to us, and we aggregate it, and we use it to show the planes online using ADSB along with all of our other feeds. And so we brought SDR to a lot of people that wouldn't otherwise be, be doing it just because they're amateurs and they're interested in tracking pl planes. Yeah, go to fledware.com slash ADSB, I think. There we go. And so just in the last two years, we've brought Software Defined Radio to a community of people that are interested in seeing what, what's in the air above them. And we now have people in our forums talking about using Blade RFs and Hack RFs and Air Spies and our hardware to do all this. And it's really neat. Uh, so we started building our own hardware. I don't know, Adam, do you remember when we started building our own hardware to sell? Yeah, so last year we started creating our own, the Floodware Pro Stick, and it's basically an RTL SDR with an amplifier on it, so it helps pick up the ADSB stuff at 1090 megahertz better. And we also have filters and antennas, and we sell them on Amazon at cost. So it, like, it, we're not profiting off any of it. It's just to get the parts out there. And so we can <clears throat> provide the parts cheaper because we get build them in quantity. This is the Pro Stick 1, and I brought 20 of them, if anybody's interested in having one. I did not bring filters, and I certainly didn't try to bring antennas through customs, because that would be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just put it this way. Customs was told that I have USB sticks, because that's technically correct, so yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah, uh, it's, it's a cool little part. Uh, we have them deployed widely around Houston because FlightAware is a Houston-based company. And I think like half of the company now has a what we call Pyware box at home. So our coverage in Houston is ridiculous. Uh, but I mean, the coverage map, you can see that we have coverage in a lot of places now. But Yeah. So, so um, get with uh, Sean or Adam after the talk. I said he's got 20 of the sticks. You'll need to get an antenna or stick a, a paper clip in it for a minute to um, get going with it. But it does function as a, as a bog standard RTL SDR as, as well, right? Yeah. I do think. Yeah, for, for the actual fly to wear stuff, there's an extra filter you need. That's what I think 10 bucks on Amazon. But if you just want to use it as an RTL SDR, after the boff, you'll be able to start immediately. Just, um, you know, again, hit your ports tree and look for the RTL hyphen SDR um, uh, port, and you should be able to start working with it. Reception will suck a little bit until you get an antenna on it, but it, it'll pick up something. It'll just be very untuned. So now Nick is working on FreeBSD to get both the Blade RF and the Hack RF working. I want to let Nick talk about those a little bit and what he's doing and some of the issues he's, ran in, he's run into. Actually, I think I saw him tweeting something about LibUSB a couple nights ago. So if there's anybody in here who's an expert on that, I'm sure he'll... Ah, good, we got an expert in the back. So, so Nick, let me uh, pass the mic off to you. Sorry, one second here. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? 
Um, so I actually got into ham, well, I've had an interest in ham radio for a long time, but the thing that really pushed me to get into it was actually more the security aspects and especially the ones uh, on the SDR side. Um, there's a lot of really, really interesting things happening on the bandwidth around us all through the air. Um, and I actually spend, most of the time I do spend, or actually almost all the time I do spend, even though I have my ham radio license, is listening, looking, going through stuff. Um, and one of the neat things about in the US, and please correct me if I misquote anything here or say anything wrong, uh, but is in the US, if something's not encoded, and it's going across the airwaves, um, sorry, not encrypted. Encoded is fine. And uh, there are some encryptions that are so old that they've been deemed more of an encoding than an encryption at this point, um, which again brings them into fair game. Uh, so for example, um, you can go around and listen to pagers and see what's going on in the air. And that, you know, that seems out of date. That might not seem too scary. But if you look about it, the only people I know left that have pagers are medical facilities and IT people who may not be too careful about what they put across those channels. Um, trunking radio systems at my university, I can get a whole tr chunk of bandwidth and then post-process it to look at all the messages. Um, the FCC very nicely uh, gives me data on what all the channel num numbers mean. So I know if it's the public uh, safety department talking or the janitors. Um, and I can tune priorities and do a lot of really cool stuff there. Um, so talking about what I'm doing uh, recently, last year I wanted to get HackRF working on FreeBSD. I believe somebody actually beat me to the punch. But to, in the port tree, it works now, yes. A year ago it was not in the port tree. Sorry, a year ago it was not in the port tree. Um, Somebody beat me to the punch on that about, you know, by when I started really looking into it, it was, there were patches open to put in the ports tree. Um, and then I ended up talking at DEF CON to the Blade RF guys, uh, and I'm currently working on trying to get this running in FreeBSD. Um, they've submitted, they've very graciously taken my uh, patches and upstreamed them to get it to compile. I have uh, a port set up for it. Um, but I'm currently facing issues in LibUSB on getting it running, um, you know, so it's kind of useless. Um, when it tries to instantiate and tries to talk to some of the filters and other stuff on here, uh, it hits IOCTLs that return uh, bad error codes. And when you look at the LibUSB code inside of there, you get, uh, it's in this really nice if statement where there's no code but a comment saying you should never reach this spot. Um, so we're not currently doing anything with it. Um, and then it just returns thinking that it should have succeeded. Um, again, I think this is uh, probably in how the Blade RF is instantiating the LibUSB stuff. Um, but yeah, I think it would be really great to do. Um, but I really, as I was saying, one of the other things interesting to look at is the security side. There are so many things out there, you know, just sitting just sitting, you, you do this with an RTL SDR, tune through stuff, a lot of really interesting um, machine to mean, machine stuff, system stuff, listening to um, F, uh, radio stations back channels where like they talk to each other and have no clue that anybody's listening is kind of hilarious occasionally. Um, yeah. So with this one, I could do 20 megahertz channels if I want to. Um, or, So Nick is right. In the US, anyhow, I have no idea how this applies to Canada or anywhere else in the world. If something is encrypted, say, for example, the, um, uh, the microwave 
um, showing up in your backyard from Dish TV or Dish, you know, whatever, don't try and decrypt it. Just leave it alone because that you, know, you can go, uh, you can get some serious fines and you can find yourself um, in in deep trouble with that. That's one of, that's one of those things that that was a gimme though to the satellite broadcasters. But um, yes, sir. Right. Now, some of the, um, depending on the municipality and how they're doing things, uh, I think some of the police bands, um, if they're doing spread spectrum, you're not allowed to put it back together. So there's, there's some subtlety. So just be careful. Of course, if you're just doing it in, in your own home, who knows what uh, that means, but I certainly wouldn't talk about it. Um, <laughs> Maybe not. Um, unfortunately, a lot of my knowledge goes back to the 80s. No, no, I mean, that's the problem is, I mean, I've, I've been um, kind of getting back up to speed. So just check what the local regulations are. Um, uh, the one thing I will tell you is if you're, if you're in Vegas around DEF CON, it's almost all bets are off. Um, <laughs> as far as GSM, um, you know, cell towers and faking out and stuff like that, I think the FCC just kind of says, okay, it's DEF CON. Um, but there, there's been some really interesting talks there. We've got just a few more minutes. Is anybody else doing anything really interesting in SDR? Yes, sir. Okay. And one of the other things some of the hams have been doing is because um, they may live in a region that doesn't ha isn't particularly well serviced. Uh, they've been using some of the ubiquity outdoor equipment to do um, point to point uh, Wi-Fi. Um, so very directional. Um, you know, if you remember back in the, uh, I worked at a company in the 90s, and our backup uh, internet connection was a point to point, you know, line of sight uh, between two buildings, and that was our. Um, so you know, hams are doing that today especially uh, in areas where there's um, you know, just not enough infrastructure. So uh, I, I would recommend check the ARRL website out. Uh, becoming a member is not that expensive, and you'll get uh, the, ARR, the ARRL magazine um, both physically and digitally for the same price. And uh, there's always something interesting going on. Anybody else doing anything interesting or just have a general question about SDR? Sounds like we've got a lot of people in the room who can answer questions. That is in um, ports today for OpenBSD. Yeah, yes, it just uses libUSB. So that stuff just works. Yes, sir. So the RTL SDR, we got confirmation, is in your ports tree. GNU radio is in the ports tree. What is? Okay. Uh, you, you should be able to plug it in and use it. And one of the things I didn't mention is, yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it would be a huge. It, that would be a huge project. Yes. What's your name? I'm Diane Bruce. Oh, this is Diane. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So um, for FreeBSD folk, free folks, talk with Diane. For OpenBSD, you can talk to me. I think Stuart, I think Stuart Henderson has been doing some of our ports on OpenBSD. Um, you know, but there's, there's more people interested in this. One thing I didn't mention, I, I just want to throw out, just because the device is limited, like the RTL SDR, uh, the way the Hack RF and the, uh, the Blade RF actually look at 20 megahertz simultaneously is it's just switching through the bands 
at microsecond speed. Now, obviously, the RTL-SDR can't do microsecond speed, but you could tune across multiple bands as fast as the USB bus can, can respond. I don't know. I was talking to Michael Osman about it. He said, you know, deep down under the hood, it's, um, it's still, um, there, there's switching going on. Okay. So. I mean, he would be the one that knows, obviously. Yeah. So, so Michael Osman is the guy who designed the uh, Hack RF. He's, in, he, uh, he's based in, I think, Denver. Or is he, is he Boulder? So, but. Yeah. But it's doing it at like eight microsecond. Um, I don't know. I didn't. Uh, we didn't get a chance. I'm going to see him in Vegas in July, uh, August, and I'll see if I can get some more details. Okay, cool. So um, we only have a minute or two left because there's another talk, but we got another question in the back. To do. Not that I know of, but. My guess is if you can detect it, it could, um, you know, if you've, got, if you've got something that can, you know, physically pick up those signals. Uh, there's been a, so uh, it's David, right? David's asking a really important and interesting question. Can you use the radio to do side channel analysis of what's going on on either the CPU or any of the other subsystems. And there's been some really good work. There was a paper presented in Brazil um, a while back where people were doing this. And if you, if you, if you follow any of the, the good tech uh, nerd sites, there have uh, been talks about this. So basically doing um, air gap um, analysis of systems. Um, so yeah, I don't know if people are using the HackRF specifically for that, but there are people who are doing that with radios.